first of all, happy birthday to, to Dirk. So I'm going to start with a, a monoid or a group, which is proto-algebraic, so it does not really matter what it means, but it just has a good um, ring or algebra of polynomial functions. So this algebra just reflects the topology of the group. And you have more, you have a coproduct, which sends one polynomial functions to pairs of polynomial functions, which is the coproduct delta, which you can see here. We just reflect the composition of the group. So this is what is called a bi-algebra if you have a monoid, and if it is a group, it is a half algebra. And you can recover, it's quite well known, the group of the monoid from the bi-algebra just by taking its characters. The characters are just by algebra morphism from your algebra to the field, which is for me the complex field. And there is a product on characters, which is the convolution, which is in some sense this dual of the coproduct. So I'm not satisfied with only one group or one monoid. I need two groups. And in fact, I want to, to do some semi-direct product or things like this. So for this, I take two groups or two monoids with a good by algebras. And I suppose that the second one, G prime, acts on the first one by uh, monoid endomorphisms, which is exactly what I need if I want to do a semi-direct product. So what does this mean? I have first a monoid G, so it has a Hopf algebra, which I call, or a Bay algebra, which I call A. I've got a second monoid G prime, which has also a Bay algebra, which is B. G prime acts on G, so B co-acts on A. So there is a correction, which is a map, an algebra map from A to A and sub B. So this is just reflect the action of G prime on J. And if I want to translate the fact that the action of G prime is by monoid endomorphisms, this means that A is a bi-algebra in the category of B commodities. So what does this mean exactly, this fourth point? This means this axiom. So the first one just means that the, this is a correction. This is the action, the axiom of a right correction. The second one means that the product of A is a, is a morphism in the category of comodule over B. And it also means that uh, the correction is an algebra morphism. This is the same. The fourth one means that the co-unit of A is a comodule morphism from A to the base field. And the last one, which is the more twisting, means that the co-product of A, the big delta, is a comodal morphism from A to A tensor A, which is also a B comodal. So this means that if you do first the correction and then the co-product on the left, this is equal to do the first the co-product, then the correction on both sides of the co-product, and then to regroup together the two terms which belongs to B. So this is this product M1324, which has four elements and regroup the second and the fourth one at the end. So for example, let's just take a very simple example. You can consider the group C with the addition, which is a group, an abelian group. And on this, the group, C star with a multiplication naturally acts by group automorphisms. So this is exactly what you have before. So the first group G is C plus. So it's algebra, it's half algebra is the polynomial algebras on C, which is first the polynomial ring with one indeterminate. With the coproduct, which is additive, the coproduct of X is X tensor one plus one tensor X. So this is a half algebra. The second group G prime is C star with the multiplication. So the polynomial algebras on C star is the Laurent, Laurent polynomial algebra, C of X and X minus one. I have to add an inverse to, to X because, uh, well, there is no zero in C star. We have another coproduct, which is multiplicative, which sends X to X tensor X. So for the first one, the big delta X is a primitive element. For the second one, it's a group-like element. So this is also half algebra because there is an inverse. And B coacts on A, 
because C star acts on C with this correction rho, which sends also X on X tensor X. In fact, more or less, the correction and the coproduct, the second coproduct, are more or less the same. So I don't like very much this uh, X minus one. I, I would prefer to have the CX, so I just forget it and I obtain a hop, uh, not a hop algebra, but a set by algebra, which is B, which is the same algebra as A with another coproduct. So it's no more hop algebra because X has no more inverse, it's just a Bay algebra. But it corrects in the same way on A with the same correction. And for this, the correction on the coproduct is the same. So this is the frame I will use now. So what I have is an algebra A with a single product and two coproducts, big delta and small delta, such that AM delta is a Bay algebra, AM small delta is a Bay algebra, and the second one coacts on the first one with the correction row, which is also the second coproduct. So what I have is an, an object with one product and two coproducts. For both coproducts, it's a Bay algebra. And moreover, there is a compatibility between the two coproducts, which is something like this. Replace just rho by delta and you obtain the second, the compatibility between big delta and small delta. So if you want to be complete, this should be called uh, Bay algebra in a category of commodal of uh, another Bay algebra, which is quite long. So I just now call them double Bay algebra or co-interacting co Bay algebra, something like this. And the first example we have is just the polynomial ring C of X with its two coproducts, big delta, which is additive and small delta, which is multiplicative. We know more examples. So for example, the well-known cone kramer hopf algebra of trees, which is based on wooded forest. I, I won't be long on the remain, remainder on it. So it's just based on rooted trees. So for me, the trees, the root of the trees are at the bottom. So if you have the trees with two vertices, one, two vertices, three vertices, four vertices. The product is the disjoint union. So it has a basis of forests. And the first coproduct is the cone primer one, just, just given by admissible cuts. So you take your, your tree or your forest, you just cut some branches, you put the branches on the right and the trunk on the left. So for example, for this tree, you can cut nothing and you obtain the tree tensor one, or you can take, you can cut everything, one tensor of the tree, or you can cut a leaf in two possible ways. You obtain two tensor the trunk, tensor the leaf, or you can cut the two leaves, which go on the right, and it remains only the root. And the same for this, you can cut nothing or everything, or the trunk after the root, or the trunk just before the leaf, and you obtain these four terms. There is a primitive part, the first two terms, which means that the unit is very simple. The unit of a forest is one if the forest has no vertex and zero otherwise. And you can observe that it is graded, obviously, by the number of vertices. If you cut a forest, you don't lose any vertex. Some goes on the left, the other on the right, but you don't lose any vertex. So this is graded by the number of vertices. So this is the most famous co-product on it. But there is a second one, which was first described by uh, Damien Calac, Kourou Chevra et Mifat, and Dominique Monson uh, in 2008, I think which is given by a process of construction and extraction. So what does this mean? For example, for this tree, uh, you can separate your trees into disjoint subtrees. So for example, you can disjoint it into three subtrees, which has only the vertex. On the left, to contract these subtrees, but nothing appears. And on the right, to put these subtrees. So here, you don't do anything. Or you can contract the edge on the left, so this subtree. So this gives this tree uh, in two possible ways. Or you can contract the whole tree. It only remains one vertex. And uh, put the other tree on the right. So this is another co-product, which is also co-associative. It's not co-commutative. You can see it. 
And it's not a Hopf algebra because you have a group like, which is the tree with only one vertex with no inverse. So you only obtain uh, a Bay algebra for this co product. And they prove that this is a double Bay algebra. So this means that this co product uh, really co acts in a good way on the first Cohn Kramer co product. And there are similar construction on post sets. Final post sets, you can see trees on, as post sets uh, just by uh, taking the order, the partial order to be higher in the tree. So, this, uh, if you have a tree, you have a post set. And such a construction also exists on finite post sets or more generally of finite topologies. So, this is the first example of, uh, for, well, not the first, the second example of double by algebra. I'm going to, to give another one based on graphs. So for this, the basis of uh, my half algebra of graphs is the whole set of graphs. So these are just simple graphs. So here you have all graphs connected or not with one, two, three, or four vertices. There is a simple product on it, which is the disjoint union. The unit is the empty graph, which is here. So for example, this graph is the product of this by itself, something like this. There is another simple product. See, there is a very simple co-product which is just given by separate two graphs into two parts. So take your set of vertices. You put some of vertices of the vertices on the left with the edges between them. The other vertices on the right also with the vertices with the edges between them. And you obtain a nice co-product which is, uh, was first defined, I think, in a paper of Schmidt on incidence of algebras. Uh, this is an example of incidence of algebras based on a post set of graphs. So this post set is just a set of graphs uh, with a given set of vertices with extraction of, uh, of edges. So this is a co-product, which is co-associative. It's really not difficult to see, and it's co-commutative. This is very different from the cohn kramer co product. This is co commutative. There is a second one, which was also, which is also can be found in the paper of Schmidt with another incidence by algebra, and which was also described in a paper of Dominique in 2011 uh, with various uh, examples on graphs, oriented graphs, acyclic oriented graphs, and things like this. So this is, as this, this is the same idea as for trees. So for trees, the first core product is just cutting the, the trees into two parts. So this is the same for graphs. The second core product was given by extraction and contraction. So this is the same for graphs. Uh, just take a graph. You can take some equivalences on the set of, of vertices. So this means that you just uh, do a partition of your vertices. On the right, you just contract your equivalent classes. So this means that you contract the, some, some subgraphs of your graphs to vertices. And on the left, you just forget the, the edges which are not between, which are in vertices, which are not equivalent. So I'm just going to give an example. So for this one, you can contract everything you just remain a vertex. And on the right, you obtain the whole graph. And you can contract only one edge, for example, this one. If you contract, you just obtain a graph with two vertices and one wedge between them, this. And the extraction is given by this edge and the other vertex, so something like this. You have three possible ways to do this. And you can just extract the vertices, which go on the right. And if you contract the vertices, Nothing happens, so the, the graph stay itself. So this is also a second uh, this is a second co-product. This is also by algebra. It is not a half algebra because there is a group like the graph is one vertex, and it has no inverse, so you don't have any antipode. It's not a big problem, but well, it's not a half algebra. And the the cognate is very simple. In fact, this is because of this part. For if graph you obtain a vertex tensor of a graph plus a graph tensor vertices and more terms. So the co unit is just given by uh, sending any graph to one if your graph is totally disconnected with no edge or zero otherwise. And you can prove 
that uh, this is really a double bi-algebra. So the second co-product, this extraction protraction co-product really co-acts on the first one. And the last example, which is the, the half algebra of uh, quasi-symmetric functions. So as a, an algebra, it's based on the set of compositions and, uh, and the composition is just the finite sequences of positive integers with these products which was used just before by Dominique, this is the quasi-shuffle product on composition. The co-product, the first co-product is given by um, deconcatenation. You just cut two words into two parts between two letters. And there is a second one, which is given by uh, extraction and contraction. So for example, for this, you will cut two words into, two, into several parts, one part, two parts, two parts, and so, sorry, three parts, two parts, two parts, and one part. You just contract the parts. So contracting just means that you sum all the letters of your word. And because the letters are integers, you can sum them. So this gives the terms on the left and on the right, you just quasi shuffle your parts. So this is another co-product. Uh, you can find it into the papers of Thibault Novelli and the other on this subject. I'm not totally sure they proved this is um, really a, a double by algebra. I'm not sure they proved the co-interaction, but well, it's true. And they prove it with a trick which is based on manipulation of alphabets. So it's not really, it's not really obvious, but you can do it uh, without uh, too many combinatorics, just with algebraic tricks. So well, uh, there is a co-unit, I forgot it which is also, uh, she's given by this. Uh, you take a word, a composition, if it's of left zero or one, the codent is one and zero otherwise. And it turns out that this is a character of QSIM, which appears in another paper by Aguiar, Bergeron and Sotile. Uh, in this paper, they, they define the category of combinatorial hop algebras, which are gradient connected hop algebra with a character, which is their pairs. And they prove that this, in, this hub, in this category, QSIM with this character, epsilon prime, uh, they don't mention that this is the coordinate of a certain co-product, by the way, but this pair is a terminal object. So this means that if you take a combinatorial hub algebra, so a connected hub, graded hub algebra with a character, you automatically obtain a morphism to QSIM compatible with this coordinate. Okay, so that's nice. These are nice objects, but the question is uh, what you can do with uh, this, what you can deduce on this construction, and well, what will it give on your this, uh, on this examples of graphs and trees and things like this. So first of all, uh, take a double by algebra A with one product and two co-products, another other by algebra B, and you're looking at morphism of half algebra or by algebra from A to B. So it turns out that the monoid of characters of uh, A for the second co-product acts on the set of by algebra morphisms by the, with the help of the correction of the, of the second co-product. So this means that if you obtain a by algebra morphism from A to B, in fact, you have a lot more by algebra morphisms from A to B. You can deform any by algebra morphisms with the help of characters of A. If you have this one, you will have uh, every one just by using the actions. So let's try to do this for, for S. So for S form a double by algebra. So this means that there should be a unique morphism from a, For rest to with both co-products. You can prove that you can compute it inductively. For example, let's just start with the first tree, the tree with only one vertex. Well, it's primitive for trees, so its image should be primitive for polynomials. And the set of primitive elements of k of x is one-dimensional, it's generated by x. So this means that phi one of this tree should be a multiple of x. 
Uh, moreover, phi1 is compatible with the second coproduct and with its co-unit, epsilon prime. Epsilon prime of this tree is one. So epsilon prime of its image should be one. So epsilon prime of lambda x is lambda, so lambda should be one. So you entirely, entirely determine phi1 of this tree, this should be x. For the second one, you do the same. Uh, let's first compute the co-product of these three. This is this, this is only one admissible cost, non-trivial. Let us apply phi one to this. Phi one is compatible with back delta, so you should find something like this. Phi one of this is this. <coughs> so this means that phi one of these three should be x two over two plus a primitive element. So lambda of x. This morphism phi one is compatible with the co-unit epsilon prime. So epsilon prime of this polynomial should be epsilon prime of this tree. So this should be equal to zero. And you obtain that lambda is equal to minus one over two. And you obtain that phi one of this tree, this is exactly this. So what, what, you, are going, what you are doing now is to prove that this morphism is unique. What is not clear is that it is really compatible with the second co-product. I only use that it's compatible with the co-unit, but you obtain for free that it is in fact compatible with the second co-product, just for free. So you can continue for like this. For this tree, you obtain something like this, which is a Hilbert polynomial, quite famous. And for this tree, this is no more Hilbert polynomial, but something like this. Maybe you, you recognize it. Uh, this is this polynomial counts the sum of the square. Uh, this evaluate to n is one square to plus two square plus etc. plus n square. So these are quite special polynomials. You can do more, in fact. Uh, well, this is a nice way to compute uh, the, you know, the invariant phi one, but it's quite long. And in fact, you can do better. You can prove some formula like this. If you take an element of your double by algebra A, you can compute phi one, phi, n of, phi one of A in this way. First, you can compute all its reduced co-products. So the reduced co-products is just by taking, by forgetting the primitive parts. So this means that for three, you just forget the trivial cuts and the cuts of everything. You can compute it and iterate and iterate and iterate or something like this. And you know that at a certain point, it will stop. Uh, the iterated co-product should be zero after a certain point. So you compute all of them. You obtain tensor of trees or something like this. You, you just apply the co-unit on the left and then you multiply the terms by your Hilbert polynomial. And this means that your invariance really counts something. If you evaluate x into an indeterminate, uh, into uh, an integer, this is a binomial coefficient. So really phi one of A just counts something for, 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 for S. And this counts something like this. This is quite a well-known uh, construction. If you take a forest with K vertices, well, just choose an indexation of the forest, it doesn't really matter. Then you can uh, associate to it a polytope of dimension K. In fact, it's determined, it's, this polytope is defined by uh, some uh, inequations. If you take one vertex, which is uh, under the, another one, x1, xi is, uh, so, 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 so sorry, the vertex a, i is uh, below the vertex j in your tree, then you associate to it an inequation xi times, uh, smaller than xj. So this defines a polytope and you want First, to delete it by an integer, i minus one uh, times the polytope, so just uh, do nomothesis. And you want to count the number of uh, integer integral points inside. So it's quite a famous result that this is, in, in fact, given by a, a polynomial sequence. So this defines uh, a polynomial which is called the Erhard polynomial. The strict Erhard polynomial is the same, but just, just count the number of vertices inside your polytopes. So this is quite known that these define two polynomials, which are related, I will say uh, later. So just to mention a problem, uh, usually in the literature on this, uh, 
the Elward polynomial in N just count the number of integral points of the dilated of the polytope by N. Here I have a problem if I do this, uh, it does not work. So I have to, to do some uh, translation by uh, one. So for example, uh, for this, so you have three vertices, which I did an index by one, two, three, from bottom to left. One is smaller than two, two is smaller than three. So your polytope is defined by uh, X smaller than one, smaller than Z, between zero and one. So the polytope associated to F is just a simplex. So if you want to, if you want to count the number of integral points into the dilated of F, what you count is the number of uh, points, x, y, z, which are inter integers, such that x is smaller than one, is smaller than z, is smaller than n minus one. And it's not very difficult to count them and to prove that this is n, n plus one, n plus two over six. So this is for the Erhard polynomial. For the strict Erhard polynomial, you count the point inside. So this means that you replace your smaller or equal by just strictly smaller and n minus one by n plus one. So this counts things like this, and it's not difficult to prove that this is this, uh, this polynomial, which by the way is in fact phi one of uh, f evaluated to n. You can do the same thing for this tree. So here you can try to, to, to draw the polytope. This is a pyramid with a square basis. You can count the number of points inside which is this, and the, so this is the Erhard polynomial, and the strict Erhard polynomial, which is again, uh, phi one of f evaluated to n. And in fact, this is uh, exactly this, uh, a unique morphism compatible with the product and the two coproducts is in fact the strict Erhard polynomial. Okay. If you look at this, you can observe that the strict Erhard and the Erhard polynomial are very similar. More or less, they are the same coefficient, and things like this. And in fact, you can prove that there is another morphism from the cone Kramer to polynomials, which is compatible with the products and two coproducts. This is not the Erhard polynomial, but more or less itself. You just replace x by minus x, and you have to correct the same. Uh, by multiplying by a, a power of minus one. And it's not very difficult to prove combinatorially that this is uh, compatible also with the product and both coproducts. But there is only one morphism compatible with, uh, with the product and the two coproducts. So this means that this morphism phi is the same as phi one. And what you obtain is an algebraic proof and the well-known duality principle for Erhard polynomial in fact, the strict Erhard polynomial and the Erhard polynomial are really closely related. Uh, this is just by evaluating x into minus one, minus x, and replace um, the thing. So here, as an application, you have a proof of the duality principle for Erhard polynomial uh, without, more or less, without any uh, real combinatorial stuff. Uh, the usual proof who uh, uses some uh, Möbius inversion in some posets, so which is uh, are really combinatorial. Can I ask a quick question here? Sorry. Yes. Um, so, so this you, you ex exemplified this as an, uh, in the case of these polytopes you get from trees via this poset yes. order. Can you also use a similar kind of argument to get this Erhard polynomial duality result for arbitrary polytopes? Uh, I, I did not manage to do it. In fact, I would need um, a half algebra structure on polytopes, a good algebra structure on polytopes. I have a product, which is the, just the, tensor, the usual product of polytopes, but I don't find the coproducts. In fact, ah. those coming from Forest are, are very, tip, very special. You see, they are defined by some inequations, which are nice. If you take uh, any polytopes, uh, I don't know how to cut it. Polytopes. So, yeah, thank you. All polytopes. So, let's do it for graphs now. So, for graphs, I can apply the formula for phi one, which I gave before. So, what does this mean? I have to do all the iterated coproducts of graphs. So, this means that I have to cut the graphs into 
uh, any number of paths I want. So the iterated coproduct just means that I will cut the graphs into a lot of parts. And then on each part, I will apply the co-unit for the second co-product. So the co-unit is one if um, the part has, has no age, and otherwise it's zero. So this means that in phi one, what appears are only decomposition of your graphs into parts with no edges. The decompo a decomposition of the graph <clears throat> is equivalent to a coloration of a graph. So a coloration is just, <coughs> sorry, just uh, associated to any uh, vertex of the graph, a color, which uh, is really is a number. So a partition of the graph is just the same as a coloration. And the coloration appearing in my phi one of A are just the coloration which are called valid. So this means that if two vertices have the same colors, uh, they should not be neighbors in the graph with no edges between them. So this means that in phi one of A, I just take in account uh, valid colorations. So this is a polynomial with counting like this, and which is called the chromatic polynomial. So in fact, what I find with graphs, the unique morphism compatible with uh, both coproducts and the coproduct is the chromatic polynomial, which is perhaps not a big surprise because if you work with graphs, you know that uh, chromatic polynomials is an essential tool for, for studying them. So this is what perhaps an explanation why it's so important. In fact, it's the unique uh, polynomial invariance on graphs, which will be compatible with uh, all these structures of uh, extraction or so contraction and extraction of subclass. Okay, so something else, no, another application. And so I'm going back to a theoretical result. In fact, uh, I'm looking for the antipode. So in all my example for the big delta, this is a hop algebra, so it has, a, it has a hop, an antipode. And for the second component, it's just a bi algebra. So no antipode. And in fact, I can prove that if I want to compute the antipode of A, I just have to compute the inverse of a special character, which is the co-unit of the second co-product. So the co-unit of the second co-product is the unit for the convolution of the second co-product. But for the first co-product, it's just a, a character with no special property. Maybe it's invertible. If it is, well, you know that A is a Hopf algebra, and you have a nice formula for your Hopf algebra. Just apply the second coproduct and then the character on the first components. So for double by algebras, if you want to compute the character, the, <coughs> the algebra, you just have to compute a special character. There is something more. In fact, maybe you observe that all my examples of double by algebras are commutative. In fact, what you obtain here, like this, is that S is a composition of algebra morphisms. So this means that in double by algebras, the antipode of A is an algebra morphism, but usually it's an anti-algebra morphism. So double by algebra are special, alge special by algebras such that the antipode is both an algebra or, and an anti-algebra morphisms. So this means that essentially, if you have a double by algebra, it should be commutative. So this is the reason why all my examples are commutative. In fact, you cannot obtain any double by algebra, which is not commutative, because well, this is one of, one of the reasons the antipode should be an algebra morphism. You can do more. In fact, you have to compute the inverse of the a character, which is not so obvious, in fact. You can do it inductively, but it's not so obvious. But if you know how to compute phi one, well, it's very easy to, to find the inverse of the character. Just take an element of your algebra, put small a, just compute phi one of a, this is a polynomial, and then evaluate it into minus one. And this is really the character alpha of a. So for example, for rooted forests, if you want to compute the antipode, um, you need to, to compute uh, the error polynomials of any forest evaluated to minus one. And it's very easy, just a power of minus one. So alpha of S is just a power of minus one. 
uh, and you obtain this formula for the antipode, which was proved by Conan Kramer, uh, not in this way at all. Uh, this is just an inductive proof. And to obtain this, uh, like something like this, uh, with no induction. It's more interesting for graphs. Uh, for graphs, uh, for a long time, the antipode was not known, not really. You can compute it inductively, of course, but it was not so clear. Uh, last year, in fact, the uh, formula was proved by Benedetti, Bergeron, and Machacek. I'm not totally sure of the pronunciation. Uh, with a combinatorial method, which was quite complicated. There is a Möbius inversion, things like this. And curiously, um, the number of acyclic orientation appears. And in fact, this is obtained with my method by this. Uh, if you want to do this, you have to compute phi one of the graph evaluated in minus one. Phi one of the graph is the chromatic polynomial. And it's quite a famous result in graph theory that the graph polynomial evaluated in minus one counts the number of acyclic orientations. And to prove this, it's not so difficult. This is just a, a combinatorial proof by induction of the number of vertices. So what you obtain is the formula by Benedetti, Bergeron, and Machacek with no more combinatorics, more or less. You just apply the chromatic polynomial evaluated to minus one. Okay. You can do better for the chromatic character. In fact, there is a very simple Hopf algebra morphism from graphs to polynomial, which is just sending a G uh, to a monomial, x to the power of the number of vertices of G. This is really easy um, to, to show that this is an Hopf algebra morphism. Of course, it's just compatible with the first co product, not with the second one. The unique morphism compatible with the second one is phi one, the chromatic uh, polynomial. And I mentioned before that uh, any half algebra morphism from graph to polynomial should be obtained from the chromatic polynomial by the action of a character. So we can write that phi zero, this very simple polynomial, uh, very simple invariant, should be obtained from chromatic polynomial by action of a character, which I denote by lambda, which is very easy to compute. It just send any graph to one. So lambda is uh, very simple character, but which is more interesting is that it is invertible for the second convolution. So this means that you can obtain the chromatic polynomial from this very simple character, the very simple morphism, just by acting a certain character, which is not so easy to find now. So this means that you obtain a formula for the chromatic polynomial. In fact, <laughs> The chromatic polynomial is the sum of all possible contraction of your graph, x to the power of the number of classes of your contraction, and then a scalar, which is uh, which, has can, which can be inductively computed. So lambda, the, this is the chromatic character. You can compute uh, its values by just by induction, and you can observe on this example that it is it's never zero. The chromatic polynomials never goes to zero. And it's seen is uh, only depends on the number of vertices. With one vertex, it's positive. Two vertices, it's negative. Um, three vertices, it's positive. Four vertices, it's negative. And you can prove it just by induction. Uh, so just by something like this, I don't have any more time. So just cut it a little bit. So. Just by this, and with this formula, you can prove that in the chromatic uh, polynomial, the things of it are um, alternate, alternating, which is a result, a result proved by Rota in the 70s, I think, with uh, complicated um, combinatorial methods. Here you obtain each just by a small combinatorial tool, which is the construction extraction of edges, and then uh, this uh, formula. For the, um, chromatic polynomial related to the chromatic character. Okay. Um, I think I've I'm, I'm got, uh, I still have five minutes. So for the moment, I talk about morphism with values to polynomials. 
Now I'm going to talk about morphism with values in the quasi-symmetric algebra. So I mentioned before that by Aguiar, Bergeron, and Sotile, uh, I know that there are a lot of morphism to it because it's a terminal object. If I want a morphism to QSIM, I just have to choose a character. And then I will obtain a homogeneous morphism compatible with the product and the first coproduct. And I've got a formula for this, which is uh, similar than the formula for the invariant, polyno uh, invariant uh, polynomial, the polynomial invariant, sorry. If I want to construct a morphism from A to QSIM, I just take all the iterated coproducts, I apply some uh, projection on it. So I project on the homogeneous parts. Then I apply the co-unit on all the parts. And I take, I take in account the, the degrees of the parts with a composition, something like this. So what can, what can I prove is if I'm looking for a morphism from A to QSIM, compatible with both bi-algebraic structures, so compatible with the products and the two coproducts, this is the only possibilities. If I'm looking for something compatible with the products and the coproducts, this is the only one which should work. Happily, it does not work uh, any, any time. I need uh, another condition. I need a uh, condition of uh, the graduation in fact, I need that the gradation, more or less, uh, just respect the first components. If this condition, this technical condition is not satisfied, well, phi one is not compatible with the second coproduct. So this means that I, read, I won't have any morphism compatible with both structures. And this is what happened for forests. In fact, my condition means that on the second coproduct, I should obtain only things with three vertices on the left. And this is not the case. There are some red trees. But this should have three vertices if I want to if I want to be compatible with the second core products. And unhappily, well, it has two, two, only two vertices. So in this case, I won't have any morphism compatible with both structures from trees to QSIM. So I have to, to cheat a little bit. Well, I just replaced forests by decorated forests. So this means that on, on, on any vertex on my forest, I had a, a decoration, which is an integer. So if I do some contraction, for example, for this, I'm contracting the edge between A and B. Well, I don't forget A and B, and I just replace the vertex, the decoration of the vertex by A plus B. So for this, now the coproduct is homogeneous. Uh, here, the weight is A plus B plus C, and on the left, and also on the right, I only obtain trees with weight A plus B plus C. So I can just put them into black. And now, with this trick, the technical condition on the second coproduct, which I change, is satisfied. So this means that I obtain for free a hop algebra morphism from forest to QC, which is homogeneous for this graduation by the, the weight. And compatible with all structure. And this is a generalization of the Erhard polynomial, which is called the Erhard quasi symmetric function. It is something like this. Okay. And the same for trees. So for graphs, sorry. And what to obtain is a generalization of the, the chromatic, uh, chromatic polynomial, which is called the chromatic quasi-symmetric function, but in fact, it's not quasi-symmetric, it's symmetric uh, for reasons of co-commutativity. And this is an object which was uh, already known by um, combinatoricist on graph theorist. Well, they, they know it, but they didn't know that it was compatible with a zero structure and uh, quasi-symmetric functions. And the last word, uh, I, I said before that Double by algebra does not run very well with, uh, co with not co non commutative um, by algebras. In fact, you can do some non commutative, can replace by index tree or planar tree, something like this. And you can also define uh, two co products. 
okay, there are two coupled decks. There are no more compatible as before, but they are still they are still existing, so why not? And you can generalize the your chromatic series or LRAT series. Uh, all the morphisms I mentioned before uh, still exist in a non-commutative way, but you cannot use any more the, the, the formalism of a double biagebra. There are no more double biagebra. So if you want to do this, if you want to explain it, uh, you have to work in another category. This is in some sense bigger, which is the category of species. In fact, all my objects are traces. This means that they're imaged by functors of something which is which exists in a category of species. In the category of species, which with two functors, which will give uh, in part the commutative objects, which are double by algebras, and your non-commutative objects, which are not double by algebras, but which are traces, non-commutative traces, or double by algebras in the category of species. So we we'll stop here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Loic. Thank you. Are there questions? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, did did you actually um, up, uh, yeah? Did you actually upgrade uh, all your formalism in in the specious uh, uh, setting? Is it yes. Alors, yes. In fact, in the species uh, settings, you can do the same. So. Okay. Um, the QCM and KX has replaced by the same object, which is a species of composition. Yeah. Which okay. is also a double by algebra, something like this. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that you have two functors, the fog functor and the full fog functors. Uh, the one will send you to commutative objects and the other one to non-commutative objects. So in fact, uh, your half algebras you obtain by the double by algebra in the setting of species are commutative in the species settings. Yeah. But it's sort of strong commutativity. So with the second functor, there are no more commutative in the usual species setting. Sure. Yes. I see you can do it all this in the set of species. Um, more or less, there are the same proofs, something like this, more or less. There are some technicalities in some sense, but these are the same ideas. Um. If I may, I'd like to ask or make a comment or ask a question. Please. Uh, thank you, Loïc, for your nice talk. Uh, you were wondering about a co-product on polytopes. There is one on cones, and polytopes can be seen as intersections of cones, and that's the way um, formulae on polytopes of the kind you were talking about um, oh. can be derived. So I think it should be possible maybe uh, going that way, um, following the path of uh, uh, Bavinok, uh, Berlin, Vern. I, was, I wonder whether it's possible. Okay, so uh, I, I, I can say that I, I found some co-products on polytopes, but more or less they are useless. They are stupid co-products and you don't obtain the, the error polynomial as an invariant. You obtain stupid things just by sending, for example, a, a polynomial x to the number of uh, vertices and things like this, or x dimension. So yeah, uh, the, the one stupid coproducts. I, I just find, found stupid coproducts, not interesting ones. OK. The one I'm, I'm thinking of is uh, very geometric, and it serves similar purposes. It's for counting integer points on cones, so it's made for that. And okay, it's so implicit it be, in, yes. uh, in uh, people's work in uh, toric uh, geometry. So, yeah, so it could be helpful, maybe. It's a geometric one. Okay, so it should be better than my one. <laughs> uh, I will look at it. There's a question from Yannick Vargas in the Q&A, and I have set him so that he can unmute, but he asks, is there a polytope associated to double post that the same way you define the polytope associated to a forest? Uh, yes, you can. In, in fact, everything I did for post can be done for, so sorry, everything I did for forest can be done for post or topologies. 
and you also obtain some error polynomials with the same properties. I just restrict myself to, to forest because it was easy to describe and process or topologies. Uh, David, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I wanted to make a comment because it's directly related to the title of this conference, in Algebraic Structures and Quantum Field Theory. Now, now look, you know very well Dick's work on the uh, Hopf algebra of renormalization, but I hope you're also aware of his recent work on uh, the uh, uh, coaction associated with the monodromy of the functions we get from the Feynman diagrams, and that's associated with cutting lines. There's an interesting question as to how that relates to uh, coaction and multiple polar logarithms that we obtain and functions beyond that. So there is facing us at present in quantum field theory, a compatibility question. It might not be directly related to your talk. And that is what about calculations in which we both cut uh, lines to discover analytic structure, but we also have subdivergences that we have to renormalize. David, yeah, yeah, it's precisely the right question, David, but I think there will be an answer pretty soon. And it has a lot to do with this. It has a lot to do with Sloik's co-interacting by Archivas. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so th thank you. <laughs> I think um, there's also some a simpler connection that just when we were looking at the general tree Feynman rules, then having the co-structure on trees, the co-interacting structure on trees, it picks out uh, a particular one, a particular choice uh, for the lower order terms. So that's, that's a more trivial observation than what David and Dirk are getting at, but it's another connection to the, to the quantum field theory situation. Agreed. Uh, I see Mishi has his hand up. Yes, um, thanks, and uh, thanks, Lloyd, for the nice talk. Um, I also have a question regarding the um, the co-products on polytopes, and yes. um, it's about. Uh, um, I mean, if there's a relation, or if you're aware of this stuff, uh, this newer stuff by Agia together with Adia on um, the hopf monoid structure of generalized permutahedra. Um, which are polytopes, and yes. on them you can define this co-product. Is this too uh, so? Um, is this too specific for your purposes? Because I think they also, at least, they ask some questions about Erhard poly polynomials there of, on the polytopes. Yes, they are, but the permutahedron are very specific uh, polytopes. All right, but in this uh, case, as, it would as also the one work. from Posets. So, very specific. so it's, it's, it's easier to define some co-products on these sort of objects, which has a strong, uh, have really a strong combinatorial structure behind them. If you take any polytopes, it's not the case. Just, uh, just a so problem. the problem. The problem is really the generalization. Then, to so so this only works for these specific polytopes. Yes, uh, I, I think that for a special family of polytopes with strong structure, you can define a co-product which give, which should give you. Uh, the Erhard polynomial or thing like this. All right. For any polytope, um, in fact, this co-product is quite, you can see it easily on the, uh, on the poset, you just, you just cut or thing like this. On the polytope, geometrically, it's not so clear for me. This is okay. a section of faces or thing like this, which is really something more complicated. Okay. So I don't yeah, know exactly to... what it is geometrically. Okay, but okay. I see. Thank you. So, so, so the problem for me that is that I can understand polytopes in three-dimensional, uh, but no more. But this is only a few, uh, three, or four, three or four examples which I can manage. So it's not enough for me to understand what happens for for bigger polytopes. So I don't know exactly what the co-product is for polytopes. All right. In the interest of time, why don't we thank Loic again now? <laughs>